إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله فإنه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله فلا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أما بعد فأوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله تعالى كما قال جل وعلا في كتاب المجيد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون My honored brothers and sisters, we begin by praising and glorifying Allah the Exalted, the Almighty. And I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship and unconditional obedience save the one true God. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the last of his prophets and the seal of his messengers. My honored brothers and sisters, a challenge that faces all of our families and our communities and our society and the world overall is the increase and the spread of radicalism and extremism. And there are those that paint this as a Muslim problem. There are those that paint Islam as that source of radicalism and extremism. And we've spoken about this before from this place. You can go on YouTube, look up Not In My Name, a sermon that talked about our faith's teachings about the sanctity of human life and our responsibility. But today I want to have a different and perhaps much more personal and yes, uncomfortable discussion with you. First, I want to challenge this assertion about where this problem comes from. You know, analysts in this country, outside of the Muslim faith, in fact, even the Department of Defense itself says that there are approximately 100 Americans that have either tried or successfully gone to support ISIS in one way or another. Now the Pew Research Foundation says there are 3.3 million American Muslims in 2015. That means that that group represents 0.003% of American Muslims. So when we have 40% of a major political party in North Carolina polling that all mosques should be closed, we have a problem. When we talk about the problem as Islam, Rather than the problem as extremism and radicalization, regardless of the religion or the color, we have a problem. So I want to start by challenging that assertion and saying that it's not fair to an African American young man, to a Muslim young man, to a Christian young man, to a young person at all, to grow up with that false choice that their skin color, that their religion puts them on a certain path. It is intellectually preposterous, it is statistically preposterous, but today we recognize something else. One young person that falls prey to this message, this poisonous perversion of Islam, is one too many. One young person who seeks comfort from depression and anxiety in the oceans of substance abuse and drugs is one too many in our community. One person who feels alone or isolated or marginalized or sidelined is one too many. So while challenging this assertion, I want to have a personal conversation. How does our religion teach us to raise young people. How did our Prophet وسلم, combat the negative influences around him and raise people 
that could face these challenges for themselves, even outside his blessed presence, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know what's incredible about our Prophet is that he was not a reactionary person. He وسلم, he thought incredibly strategically. He thought far, far ahead. Especially when he dealt with the most impressionable and, impressionable and, and vulnerable of minds, but also the highest potential. And those were the children and the youth. Yes, he وسلم, in our language, he performed the roles of a mentor, of a counselor, of a guide, as well as a Prophet But he was also there before the problems happened. He helped the companion who was a drunkard. He helped the companion that felt an inclination towards fornication. He helped people with their marital problems, but he did something else that many of us have forgotten. He solved the problems before they ever had a chance to materialize. He built relationships, particularly with youth and children, before there was a struggle. So that on that day, when they felt lost, they would rather turn to no one but Him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Azza wa Jal taught Him and taught us this paradigm. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Chapter number 2, verse 143, Allah Azza wa talk about His expectations of us and the, and the Muslims. He said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا And thus did we make you a middle moderate nation that you may be witnesses over mankind and that the messenger will be a witness over you. So when the Prophet وسلم, taught his companions moderation or taught them balance or built within them self-esteem and security and helped them construct their worldview to find their place in this world, to know God, know His creation, and know where they fit in. He didn't wait for them to engage in a high-risk behavior. He didn't wait for them to come to Him when he, they were drowning. No, rather, let me surprise you. He taught them moderation and balance in the matters that you might think were the most trivial of affairs. There is a beautiful story that is narrated to us by the honorable companion Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. And this story, like I said, occurs in a moment that you and I might trivialize, but the Prophet وسلم, did not let go of any opportunity to elevate his ummah and to teach others. So this was a day during the rites of Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage that's a requirement for every believer, whoever is able to do it financially and physically. And Ibn Abbas was with the Prophet ﷺ in his farewell pilgrimage, the only Hajj that he made in his blessed life. And this hadith is narrated in Sunan Ibn Majah and in Nasa'i. And this narration is from Ibn Majah and Ibn Abbas قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ غَدَاتًا عَقَبًا وَهُوَ عَلَى نَاقَتِهِ أُلْقُتْ لِحَصْرًا The Prophet ﷺ was upon his she camel and it was time to gather the small stones, the pebbles that are used in one of the rites of Hajj and that is the Jamarat the stoning of the, the locations of the Jamarat part of the rites in the wajibat of Hajj. And the Prophet ﷺ could have gathered the pebbles himself. But as we mentioned, he never lost an opportunity to teach and elevate those around him. So he told Ibn Abbas, gather for me some pebbles. 
And Ibn Abbas gathered them and he says, فَلَقَدْتُ لَهُ سَبْعَ حَصَيَاتٍ هُمَّ حَصَ Excuse me, هُمَّ حَصَ الْخَذْ So he brought for them seven small pebbles that are moderate and small in size. And then he handed them to the Prophet And then he took them and he started to toss them and move them around, examine them in his blessed hands. And he said, With the likes of these, perform your rites, throw the jamal. ثُمَّ قَالْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوَّ فِي الدِّينِ فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ الْغُلُوُّ فِي الدِّينِ He said, O oh people, be wary of extremism in your religious affairs. For verily those that came before you were destroyed by their extremism in their religious affairs. My brothers and sisters, with all the deepest respect to Hajj and its rights, for our Prophet ﷺ that called a society to honor their women when they literally buried their infant daughters alive, for a Prophet who taught people animal rights and to be stewards of the environment when they abused the earth and figured that everyone was there to serve them, for a Prophet that called people to economic justice, to social justice, when injustice was rampant among his people. Could you find a more apparently trivial and simple matter than the size of stones in Hajj? And yet, a person who trivializes this judges differently than the Prophet And there is wisdom in this. Because the person who starts to be extreme and not moderate in what is small will one day be extreme in what is larger than it. A person who starts transgressing the values of their morals and their ethics in what is apparently small, a rough word to a friend, rough manner to his mother and father, strife and division, one day unattended, that will become what is larger. Whether it's the real struggles in our community of substance abuse, of risky behavior, of suicide, or even of extreme violence. The Prophet echoes a teaching that is mentioned elsewhere in the Holy Qur'an. And this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number 5, verse number 77. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ O oh, people of the scripture, do not exceed limits in your religion beyond the truth. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا أَهْوَاءَ قَوْمٍ قَدْ ضَلُّوا مِنْ قَبْلُوا وَأَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا and do not follow the inclinations of a people who have gone astray before and misled many and have strayed from the soundness of the way. And what is incredible about the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ is that echoing that sentiment, taught that, that teaching given to us in Surah Al-Baqarah, he did not teach that extremism was one end of a spectrum. But rather he taught that extremism comes in two flavors. And in the middle, you find wasat and balance and moderation, and it is there you will find the teachings of our religion. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, has an incredible statement. He says, مَا مِنْ أَمْرٍ أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ there is no command that Allah has issued except that the Satan 
has two directions that he pushes people towards. Imma ila ifrat wa imma ila tafrid. He will either push people to extreme laxity or he will push people towards extreme rigidity. In other words, to push people either to leave and be careless and heedless, or to push people to be obstinate and hard-headed. And in this, we find many ahadith that challenge our assertion of what it means to be a good Muslim. I don't only mean extremism in violence and substance abuse and so on, but even extremism in what appears to be good was cautioned against by the Prophet There is an incredible story narrated by Anas ibn Mal, where three people came to the houses of the wives of the Prophet and asked their wives, his wives, about his worship And it's as if they assessed that his worship was kind of little compared to their expectation. But then they assessed themselves and they said, where are we compared to the Prophet ﷺ? When Allah has forgiven him and elevated him to this level, they said because he's the Prophet, we have to worship and do good even more. And the narration continues, قَالَ أَحَدُهُمْ أَمَّا أَنَا فَإِنِّي أُصَلِّي اللَّيْلَ أَبَدًا As for me, I will stand up in night prayer forever. Never go to sleep. وَقَالَ آخَرُ أَنَا أَصُومُ الدَّهْرَ وَلَا أُفْتِرْ And another said, I shall fast all days, I shall never break my fast. وَقَالَ آخَرُ أَنَا أَعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاء فَلَا أَتَزَوَّجُ أَبَدًا The third said, I will leave women, I shall never marry. But what these honorable, esteemed companions missed that the Prophet taught him is that moderation comes as a balance. And as extremism in what Allah has prohibited and sanctified such as human life and property and honor is prohibited, so also extremism even in the size of pebbles or in what is good beyond the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is also not from our religion. And the Prophet ﷺ came to these people and he inquired about them and verified that they had said this. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, أَمَّا وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَخْشَاكُمْ لِلَّهِ وَأَتْقَاكُمْ لَا As for me, I am the most revering and humble before Allah, and I am the most pious towards Allah. But I fast some days and I break my fast some days. And I pray part of the night and I sleep part of the night. And I marry from among the women. Then what did he say وسلم, at the end of the hadith? Did he say, I'm a little bit disappointed with you? Did he say, this is not right? Did he give them a light, light reprimand? Rather, he gave them a statement with the weight of mountains. The love of a loving father, but the weight of a mountain. He said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنْ As for the one that seeks other than my sunnah, that leaves my sunnah, he is not from me. This is not true religious practice. And my brothers and sisters, that is exactly why we started the khutbah today in that manner. Because rhetoric matter, and rhetoric matters and words affect people. When we honor the crimes, of so-called ISIS and similar groups, by giving them that name, imagine something that is neither a state nor in the remotest sense Islamic is given that name as if legitimizing their call. 
When we call this travesty a caliphate, we insult the efforts towards justice and equality and uprightness by the likes of Abu Bakr and Umar who gave the name Khalifa its right. And in reality, we are sending a poisonous message to a generation that doesn't need to hear it. We didn't call the philosophy of Timothy McVeigh radical patriotism. Nor were the two mass shooters this week called radical white men or radical Christians. Because what they did is not American, it's not Christian, and it is not indicative of white people. And it's time that we refuse to hear the term radical Islam. Yes, radical Muslims, radical people from any city, radical people from any color might do something that is wrong, that we stand against. But the problem is not that they're Muslim or Christian or Jewish or non-believers. The problem is not they're white or black or another color. The problem is radicalism, extremism, and terrorism. The problem is the broken homes, the mental, untreated mental illnesses, the distorted worldviews that got them there. And the reality is each of us struggles to make our homes, our communities, our neighborhoods, a place where at least those early steps are not allowed. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم استغفروا أن أقول بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أقول لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. My honored brothers and sisters, I mentioned to you that today's khutbah is a deeply personal and perhaps uncomfortable but necessary conversation. Because the reality is, even as we hear horrific news on the headlines, and we're, we're moved, for people suffering due to all forms of injustice and war and aggression here and across the world, that's not how we experience those headlines. We don't experience it as pundits analyzing the news, or things happening thousands of miles away. We experience it as fathers and mothers that are seeking to raise children and know that they have to navigate these confusing waters. We experience it as families going out to the restaurant or getting on an airplane or going to the mall and wanting, like everyone else, to have safety and security and opportunity for our families and especially our children. We experience it as Muslims, but even more as human beings. And in fact, there has not been more blood shed in any religion than that of Muslims from conflict all across the world in recent times. I say this because I think a big problem that we can be part of solving, if we can't affect what's going on in the world, perhaps we can affect what's going on around the corner. A big problem is that many of us have forgotten that Sunnah we become reactionary. You know, alhamdulillah, we do our part here to be positive members of the community, and part of that is to root out extremism and to speak openly, to give our children that opportunity to learn a moderate, balanced understanding of Islam. But the steps before are what I experience in my office or what I meet you with so much more. And like the Prophet ﷺ, if a person comes to us with a struggle, if a family comes to us with a conflict, if a person comes to us with a challenge, we will do our best as a community to support. But the reality is, support after the problem is never as effective as support before. And connecting with our children only when they're at risk is much less effective than having a relationship that can be drawn on 
when they have that inclination. My brothers and sisters, I'm here to say without hesitation that be it drugs or materialism or violent extremism, some politicians may think that they can get votes by saying radicalization happens in mosques, but the reality is people don't get radicalized in mosques. They get radicalized online. Look at any of the sad incidents of any religion, you will find before it isolation, distance, broken homes, problems with their fathers, lack of a male role model, all of these contributors that can lead to a risky and destructive behavior. So I said today I don't want to talk about what's going on halfway across the world, I want to talk about what's going on in our homes. The reality is today we need to talk about those pebbles in our lives. We need to talk about our worship and our implementation and our sunnah. Because the start of solving these problems is being involved with our children is being present in our homes. My brothers and sisters, dare I say, that perhaps one of the strongest places that a healthy journey to Allah and to understanding this religion starts is around the dinner table. And so I want to invite all of us for two things to close today. First, that we redouble our commitment in this following the sunnah of the Prophet to be involved with our children before there's a risk, before there's a problem, before there's a concern. Brothers and sisters, if you don't know your teenage son or daughter's three best friends, tonight is the night to find out what their names are and what they do. Brothers and sisters, if you don't know your youth group or your child's hobbies, outside of Salah and the Masjid, tonight is a tight night to start changing that. And if these circumstances and these environment has pushed us away from the mosque, let me say nothing should push us more to come together. Because it is in isolation and it is far from community and role models and male role models and female role models that any youth of any religion becomes prone to risky behavior. And the second is one that I've emphasized and I'll continue to emphasize. That we become involved with our society. You know, every week we get questions on, on Facebook, on email, on my voicemail. Sometimes with a lot of aggression people ask, do you oppress your women? Do you believe in violence? Does your religion call you? And I used to react so defensively, so uncomfortably. But you know, this, these reflections that we're sharing today made me realize something. These questions don't come from a vacuum. Some of them come from a lack of knowledge, and that's why we need to be involved with our neighbors and our children in study circles, in youth programs, in classrooms so that we can counter ignorance with education. But you know what? That's not where most of these questions come from. It's not ignorance of the text. It's ignorance of the people. That's why in this place we've had divinity schools, college students, members of other faith traditions, they come in Sometimes you see their face, fists clenched, their faces tensed. But after they come in, they eat, they drink, they ask their toughest questions. The fists release and the face softens. Because the experience of meeting a Muslim is more powerful than reading a thousand, about a thousand of them. And more often, People just don't know who we are. And it's high time and it's long time that they do. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal 
to use us in every cause of goodness and to make us callers to this religion. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our youth, the youth of our society and our world from every evil and every harm and every form of extremism. I ask Allah to bring us together as one community, to allow us to work through our differences. I ask Allah to enable us to raise incredible young men and young women. I ask Allah to protect us from the evils of materialism and temptation and from the evils of online and technology. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us righteous spouses and to have mercy on our parents as they raised us when we were young. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhaab al-nar. Allahumma a'inna ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizukna attiba'a. Wa arina al-baatila baatila wa rizukna ishtinaba. Allahumma ameen, ameen, ameen. Special announcement that inshaAllah on Saturday, March 5th, from 12 noon to 4 p.m., there will be the IAR open house right here. Everyone is welcome, especially your neighbors and those of other faiths. Uh, there's a full announcement online Saturday, March 5th, from 12 noon to 4 p.m. There's some flyers online or you can circulate the, uh, on, um, excuse me, flyers outside or you can circulate the announcement from the, the website. عباد الله أن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإنتاء ذي القربة وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وأنفسكم